Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Live here on Keystruck Medium. I am Josh Hayes. And guess what? We have a special guest host today. Lauren Moore is here from... Hello, hello. And today, you... Oh, check this out. This is my... This is my... Yeah. <laughs> Yudahandraya Vijay Ratna joins us from Sri Lanka, the author of The Salvage Crew. Fun fact, his name is actually like 27 names long, and Yuda <laughs> is like his just abbreviated name. But that's my claim to fame is I think that I can pronounce it correctly. How'd I do? Um, uh, let's say uh, close enough for government work. <laughs> For some, for some particularly small governments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, a very unfunded government that's back on their... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something well, that you're know, just, just, just entering economic recession. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried. I, I tried. You ever see that... that uh, what's that Bart Simpson gif where he picks up a, a cake on the table and it says, at least you tried, and then he picks it up and dumps it in the trash can? And dumps it, yes. Yeah, that's... Like, really, like my, my name is like weird and difficult to pronounce even for some Sri Lankans. Um, that, now, we, that's, now that's interesting. <laughs> we, we, I've actually had this like when, um, when, like when I was in school. Um, so few of my teachers could actually get my name right. But I had to wear this metal name tag. And they would still get it wrong. So I have like random math and chess certificates written to you. All sorts of people who don't exist. All, that's, my, that's my entire school record right there. <laughs> and um, once when I was going to Singapore, like I remember the the visa officer, and they're all like very polite and very professional, right? Looks at my name, looks at me, looks at my name, looks at me, says, Did your parents love you as a child? Oh. I was like, no. Oh, oh, damn, son. <laughs> wow. What is the tradition behind all of those names? Where does that come from? Um, so it's ancestry uh, and also clan and heritage markers. So let's say, like my full name is Rajapaksa Kona Rabutian Sarage Bilesha Yudanche Bandara Vijayaratna. So Rajapaksa, if you break it down, is something like ruling clan. Kona Rabutian Sarage, Kona is a name, Rabutian uh, implies merchant. So at some mm -hmm. point, this dude was basically part of a ruling clan decides to break out, build his own dynasty as a merchant. And supposedly he was also rich enough or powerful enough to do it because merchants are con would have been considered slightly lower class. Um, and then Yudan Pilesh Yudanja is my name. Bandara Vijayaratna are two sort of famous clans in the region that amalgamated. And both of them were powerful enough that certain political jockeying would have happened to keep both names. So this is like roughly 500 years of history and etymology packed wow. into it. Yeah. yeah. You've got a novel packed into your name right there. Yeah. 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 So you'll find Sri Lankans with names like this, and then you'll find people who have like functional names like Roshan de Silva, yeah. where presumably at some point, like when the Portuguese or the British uh, invaded and took over, uh, at some point, they pay, they, some of their ancestors have gone, okay, let's abbreviate. Hmm. So do you have anybody in Sri Lanka like that gets born and their parents are like, you know what? He's a Bob. Like we're just gonna name him Bob. Anybody like you're just get a normal, uh, like like a like a, uh, a a Western European type name? I feel like wholly inadequate. Like who's this, Josh Hayes? What's your name mean? I, nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. That's my parents rolled the dice and they were like, here you go. So we had a lot of very Western names in the previous generation. Uh, with this, would have been before people who were born around um, independence from the British. So you have like fantastic names like. Frederick Johnston Fernando, uh, and things that things that kind of sound like they're, they're out there with Winston Churchill. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, so we, we've got that. And then I think our generation basically went, uh, how about, no, we want the unique email addresses because everything else is taken. So let's get back <laughs> to the name. And name. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it actually, it's good because you don't have to have your name and then like a random number at the end at Gmail. No. You could just have your name. Yeah. Like it, and your URL, like I looked up my URL. This is what makes me mad about my name. Uh, I'm sure there's tons of Josh Hayes everywhere, but the Josh Hayes that gets Google is a motocross motorcycle rider. Um, <laughs> and every, you, you, unless you type in author at the end of my name, all you get is this motorcycle guy. Um, the, the crazy thing is Josh Hayes.com is open, but it's owned by a uh url company and they wanted like three grand for the the url and i was like i but i don't got that i got 50 if you want that and yeah i couldn't get it mm. uh, 
So good times. Uh, let's see who's in the chat today. Let's see who gets. Oh, Rick Partlow gets the keystroke medium golf clap of appreciation. Thank you, Rick. Good morning. William Tyler Davis is in the chat. Charlie Dunn's on the road driving through New Mexico. Hello, Charlie. Welcome to the show. And Rick Partlow. Yes, my office looks empty. So, uh, we're in the middle of trying to sell our house. And so our realtor came in and they were like, take everything off the walls. Um, no personalization, no nothing. So all my bookshelves are gone. All, all the dolls are gone. <sighs> <laughs> I'm gonna let that slide, Lauren, because you graciously volunteered to guest host. It is true. You're walking a fine line. The collectibles <laughs> are in a box in the garage. We actually got a pod, a 16 foot pod, and we put a whole bunch of stuff in there and our house is still not empty. Anyway, so we had to paint. My office is completely empty. I actually have a whole bunch of blankets on the ground. Uh, see if you can see back there to cut down on the echo. Uh, we'll see how, how that works, but yeah, let's see. Andrew Cole. Welcome. Welcome. Greetings and salutations. And John Evans. It's uh, the afternoon over in the UK. Welcome. Um, what have I been up to? I finally, the other day, I think it was yesterday, finally was able to sit down and write after two weeks of absolutely no words whatsoever. I sat down and wrote a couple uh, pages in uh, the Tranquility series that uh, Devin and I are working on. Um, hopefully here now that the kids are back in school, I can get a couple weeks of uh, good writing time before the holiday break, and then they're off for two weeks again. And then blah. Um, so yeah, moving and packing has killed my uh, writing time, and then uh, the the holiday is coming up. So that's that's my update. I'm I'm reading uh, Rhythm of War, Sanderson, Take a Shot, um, and loving it. Uh, I think it's really good. Um, it's it's your typical Sanderson book because it's super long. So they're like. I don't know. Let's just say a hundred thousand words in, and now they're finally getting to the, the the point of the book. And it's funny on Audible, it comes as five parts, and every single part is the length of a regular novel. And so you get to the end of part one is eleven and a half hours in, and you're like, "Holy crap! I've got forty five hours left to go in this book." Um, and this is also a guy who basically wrote an 80k word chapter once, right? When he was finishing Robert Jones' yes, Wheel of Time. Right. There's a single chapter there that's longer than any novel I've written I've published today. Right. <laughs> okay. This is just flexing at this point. Oh yeah. Well, it's crazy because when you get to his like when the the start of Act Three or the climax or the last battle or whatever, you you still have like 250 thousand words to go. <laughs> You're like, what? What? <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's good time. So, but, uh, uh, I, as soon as that is done, the salvage crew is actually on my to be L list. Uh, so I will be starting that next. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but first Lauren, what have you been up to this week? Well, I've been doing a whole lot of research for one. We've got Betsy Wallum coming on the show on Thursday. She's the president at Daw Books. So uh, Kayleen Ivey, we've been researching her and also researching what topics our audience is interested in for next year. So we're planning out 2021. Um, we're polling the audience. We're looking at 20 books to 50K and seeing what people are asking about, interested in, and what guests might kind of line up to answer those questions. So that's what we've been doing recently. Also, I've been working on a historical uh, Western novel and again doing research. JSTOR has this really cool offer where you can read 100 articles per month for free. Uh, they're a humanities database. So I've been researching um, printing presses and outlaws and sheriffs back in the 1860s and 1870s because I can read all of this for free in 2020 and I'm very excited about it. Oh, that's pretty cool. What, uh, what's, the, what's the book about? Uh, the book is a, it's a romance. It's about um, a girl whose friend took her there to Laramie, Wyoming in book one. And now it's book two and the best friend is going to have her book. And uh, meanwhile, in Laramie, the town is getting inundated by rakes and um, railroad workers and prostitutes and all kinds of interesting people coming off of the train that's just rolled through. And it's, 
thousands of new people in a very tiny town and the whole town gets kind of torn inside out. But to reestablish order, the people who have set themselves up as sheriff and deputy uh, kind of take power into their own hands and take it too far. And then the town has to deal with this new order that's been established from the top. Uh, meanwhile, my heroine, she's going to be part of that and figuring out how to, to save the day. Very cool. So. Actually, I lived in Wyoming for six years in, uh, in China. Yeah. Um, I love that country. I, I didn't when I lived there, but now looking back, it's, it's a fantastic area. Cheyenne's close. The railroad went through Cheyenne first and then went to Laramie next. So they brought all of those people from Cheyenne kind of over. It's crazy. The entire population of Wyoming, the state, would fit in Wichita. The city. Wow. Yeah. And fun fact, um, because Cheyenne is right on the corner of Nebraska and Colorado, we used to drive back to Wichita for like family vac uh, vacations and holidays and stuff. And it's about a seven and a half hour drive from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Wichita, Kansas. It's also a seven and a half hour drive to go from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming, <laughs> because of the way the state is set up. So, yeah, I don't know why that's a fun fact. But, you know, what about you? What have you been up to this week, buddy? Um, let's see. A few sort of disparate things. Uh, first is on the research side, we're looking at, I hate to call it AI. Well, let's say machine learning for misinformation in, in different languages. Yeah. Um, because AI, there's this whole hype about AI um, that sometimes is not very useful uh, to the conversation or rather towards the precision of the issues at hand. Um, so I've been doing that and that's basically five days a week. You know, I've run two teams here, the ones in Sri Lanka, the others in Bangladesh. So that's, that's five days gone. Um, on Saturday, I write. So I've been sort of getting through about roughly about 7,000 words a week on this story that I'm writing that takes the Witcher and flips it sort of sideways. So you've got the Witcher-like stereotypical character, the demon hunter rolling into town, and it's, the beats are very much structured along a Western, say, mysterious character rolls into town, the townspeople want to sort something out, except it's a sham. The Witcher is a dumbass. Like the Witcher analog in, in my story is a dumbass. The actual mastermind is a cat. Uh, <laughs> right? and, and, the, and this guy is like the, the witcher-ish character, shall we say. He's a, he's a paladin. So, you know, good looking, stands still, poses well and all that. And when he's done all that, he just really likes classical music, right? And the cat's like, oh my God, you're a dumbass. I'm going to go <laughs> prepare because you're going to get shot out there. Uh, and they had this stuff like, um, you know, they, they, I, wrote a, I wrote the first story for Kate Pickford's anthology, Hellcats. And they call into town, and the townspeople are basically like, um, you know, the, 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 there's a farmhand. Uh, he's speaking in languages, and uh, he's speaking in tongues, and he's like, he's digging up dead man's gold. And the guy's ex fiance says, like, he did things. And everybody tells him, and goes, you, you shut up, stop talking. Uh, and they go out, and, and the suspicion is that this, this guy is in, uh, infested by a demon. So they, there's this whole the exorcist setup, and they go out there. And meet the demon, and the demon's like, "Yeah, dude, of course they're speaking in tongues. I'm trying to teach, teach him a second language." <laughs> and yeah, we have gold. Like, do you know that you can invest with the Carriageman's Guild, and you get 14% per return on your on your money for annum? Like, we're trying to build this guy a better life here. What are you on about? And, and both of them were like, oh, "Okay, so this is awkward. Like, we can't kill you now. You're actually <laughs> trying to build a better future for this guy. So what do we do?" So it's basically taking that witcherishness doing that level of world building and then just flipping it on its head just for fun mm. um that's been that's just been massive fun it's it's been a relief to write fantasy and to also do the perspective of a bit of an asshole like talking cat really who is sort of very very peculiar about his ways so in some ways it feels like i'm writing me <laughs> have you ever read um uh it's a uh, butcher, Jim Butcher's, uh, the Cinder Spires, the, uh, the, the aeronauts win less. No, he, no I, I, I've been recommended it. I haven't yet had the time to read it. Properly. So he's also got talking cats in that series. Mm. Um, and the way he writes them, like you look at it and you're like, yeah, I, 
I don't, I'm not a cat person. I'm actually allergic to cats. And when I look at the cat, I think the way that this cat is thinking, like he's, he's very, looks down his nose at people. He's very like snobbish and knows everything and sarcastic and got this dry humor. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a cat. The cat is like, walks over and pushes the glass off the counter and looks at you like, what are you yeah. going to do about it? Type. Yeah. This is exactly that sort of cat. He's, he basically <laughs> lowballs everyone. And yeah, the paladin is really a nice person. Mm-hmm. And he will sit for hours and just, you know, talk about, he's, he's very good at killing people. He's also very good at music critique. So he'll get distracted by, you know, oh, that chord progression is br- brilliant. And the cat's like, focus on the bloody tournament. <laughs> <laughs> you're, gonna get, you're going to get shanked in the ass, my lance, if you don't <laughs> forget the chord progression. <laughs> so it's, it's nice. fun. It's a lot of fun. And so you said you only work, you, you write on Saturdays. Uh, yeah. So do you get, and you mentioned you got 7,000 words that week. Do you get, do you get a lot of words when you sit down on, on that single day to write? Yeah. Generally I try to hit between five and 7,000 and that's generally sort of what I can pull off in a single day. Um, Sundays I have miscellaneous human things. Mm. I'm told that you need to talk to people occasionally. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. sometimes. Maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. Because I write <laughs> in my office in my bunker and then I go deal with five year olds. Maybe I need to, like, I don't know, have an adult friend somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but we're doing, we're doing Minecraft, aren't we? So, yes. I suppose that counts. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. So I, I made a post in the group that I don't know what happened to the Bedrock server. The, it, it, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's not working. How about that? Um, but the Java server is up and running, and I, I've been messing around on it for a couple of days. If you want the um, server login, just send me a message. I'll get it to you. I don't want to put it out there and just have everybody jumping on the server, like random. I don't know who you are, people. So uh, if you want to come in, basically, it's just hanging out and chilling and building some stuff and talking like just hanging out that's all it is there's not i don't if you don't if you play minecraft you get it if you don't play minecraft i'm probably going to do a stream Uh, i don't know if i'm going to do it tonight or tomorrow but i've been thinking about doing it in the evenings if i'm going to play i'll just do a stream and then like talk either about books that i'm reading or writing or if anybody wants to hop in like discord we can hang out and chat or whatever um and just kind of do a stream like that um so anyway uh we'll see um like the last time i played minecraft with a friend um, he stole my boots, and I filled his house with lava. <laughs> yeah. What's great? Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Hermitcraft, but it's like a big um, multiplayer server where these guys, they I mean, they play Minecraft for a living, right? They get they get paid to play uh, uh, on, they have massive YouTube channels. Like this dude, Mumble Jumbo, has like 7 million f- subscribers on YouTube, like crazy yeah. numbers. Uh, and they all, the builds are absolutely massive. Like I go on and I'm looking at it, like they do it in a day and I'm like, that would literally take me six months to build this, the big, huge thing that they have going on. So, uh, it's a fun game just to kind of sit back, chill and relax Mm -hmm. and kind of decompress or whatever. Uh, okay. So we're talking about the salvage crew today and I am going to put a link in the chat somewhere. Where are you? It's odd not having two computers. I know this is going to sound weird to a lot of people, but my command center is like ridiculously downgraded right now because my Mac is packed away and I can't get to it. And so I only have the PC and only have one computer. Usually I'm like, oh, I'll just go over to the other computer. I can't do it now. I yeah, like- I get that. My, um, my laptop, my, this is a really good Chrome, Chromebook. It burned out for some reason. And I have this machine, which I really like, which is for gaming and high performance compute but it kind of feels like overkill like some days i just i just want to open a word document and type some words in and i don't want to deal with all of this going on but uh, i ordered something called the onyx books air have you seen it i have not um, it's essentially think of a 10 inch kindle that comes with a pen that you can write with the the onyx book note air yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's this, it's this gorgeous sort of very thin Android tab. It's a full-featured Android tab. It's got, um, it's got an in screen. And the best part is you can write on it. It has a stylus. And you can write longhand. You can write in, you know, you can open a notebook and you can just write and it'll, it has character recognition. So it'll convert that to text. Wow. 
That's amazing. So this is so real. Yeah, um, yeah, Christopher Family was on the show the other day, and he was talking about how he likes to write by hand so much. Yes. But that's all goes into a notebook, and it's not like words that you can copy and paste and use later. You'd have to type them up yes. later. Uh, but if that writing by hand helps your creative juices to flow, helps them up the muse to speak, then it would be right there in your computer already, and you can just stick it into your manuscript. If you exactly. Use. And it's, it's essentially an Android tablet, so you can do whatever you want with it. So I've sort of been eyeing this thing for a while, and um, when they went up for order again, I uh, hit the button, hit the order button. It's somewhere, I hope, over the Atlantic Ocean right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. But this is going to be my replacement. It comes with a keyboard, so I can stick that in and keep writing four week oh, battery. It life. does come with a keyboard. That's cool. Yeah, they've they've got this offer for like a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, that you can slot it in like one of those Surface books. And it's got a full week battery life. Oh, wow. I'm looking at it right now, and that is, it's, it looks really nice. Yep. I, it would take some convincing to, to, to have the, the old wife sign off on the, the purchase because it's, it's, it, it's, like it's not like an Android Fire tablet that's like 49 Like the one I'm looking at is the 13-inch mm. one, and it's on Amazon it's 879 Hmm. Um, but that, that looks really cool because I like doing a lot of note writing by hand. But I've got tons and tons of like legal pads with all my notes on it. Right. It'd be cool to have that. Same. Like my problem is I always start out with a notebook, and then there comes a moment when there's just too much information for me to access it again. So I have to go to Notion and then type the whole thing in, and that part I genuinely hate. I hate yeah. transcribing my own notes. So I'm hopefully this solves the problem for us. I would love that, and then I also got this the same recorder that um, Michael J. Sullivan uses. I bought uh -huh. this the other day and worked really well. I've got this uh, like battery powered sound noise canceling mic that plugs into it, so I can, having that tab where I can write notes on and carry it around and then voice dictate off the tab like that would be legit. Nice, nice. see, that's a great workflow, and. I, I like as much as I do like my computer, I'm not a fan of staring at this large screen for 10 to 12 hours a day, which is sort of what I do right now. Yeah. And I really want to go back to just sunlight and something that, that looks like paper. So hopefully, slightly better working conditions. That'd be cool just to lounge on the couch and just write and then yeah. not have to worry about retyping all that stuff. Yeah, or awesome. take a walk, awesome. go out in nature, and be inspired by what's going out there. And yeah, pretty much. And also four weeks of battery life. I'm on a laptop-ish device. Oh wait, four? I thought you said a full week. Four weeks? No, no, no. Four weeks. It's wow. it's got a Kindle's battery life, basically. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. So you can go on any trip. You can go to the beach, and you don't have to even worry pretty about much. the battery. Pretty much. And it's got a, a 4G connect. Well, one of them has a 4G connection. Pretty much. So I was just going, okay, forget the Chromebook. We're not going back to Chrome OS anymore. Yeah. We're going, we're going fancy now. So you, did, you didn't have this super cool tablet for writing the salvage crew, um, but mm. you do have your week schedule set up. You've got you know, your five days of research, your one day of writing. You've got habits. You've got strategies. What did go into planning and plotting and then writing the salvage crew? Um, let's see. Uh, to start with, salvage crew started out as a tech demo. Um, so essentially, the first part of salvage crew was seeing OpenAI come out with GPT-2, which is this giant um, machine, machine learning, deep learning model that writes well, at least according to the marketing and the PR that they put out, is able to generate surprisingly realistic text. I was very impressed by when I went to their page, I saw um, an article about finding unicorns. And it was written exactly as if like a very sober um, Guardian or Intercept writer would have, well, yeah, Guardian writer would, would work, like a very sober Guardian writer writing about the discovery of unicorns, it's referenced fake scientists, it's done this and that, and this is all, this is all machine generated. So I was really interested in that. And I kept thinking, what are the conversations that we are having around the office? And some of the themes of my work is basically the future of work and what that's going to look like. So one of the things that I kept going was, 
okay, look, this tech is here. Um, and you have, uh, so in my field, I get to meet a lot of technology activists, a lot of policymakers, politicians, tech folks, sort of at this intersection, right? So you have a whole bunch of people going, oh my God, the machines are coming for us. Uh, we're going to be taken over by AI. And I kept going, no, that's a boring story. Let's actually look at what happened in a field where um, people got, well, someone got outdone, really. And I went back and I looked at Gary Kasparov getting beaten by IBM's Deep Blue in 97, 98. And the newspaper headlines are very much the same, you know, man defeated by machine, the end of humanity, because here you have arguably the greatest chess master to ever have lived getting beaten by, by machine. But what Kasparov did next was interesting. He came up with, well, he started promoting something called advanced chess, where instead of human versus machine, it was human plus machine, a human plus a chess engine versus another human plus a chess engine. And it's something you found like random housewives and like schoolboys with like mid-level, um, like mid-level chess skills, like not people who have grandmaster tiers of dedicated or time spent on the game rising to that rank. You found them suddenly outperforming every single grandmaster and every single chess engine out there. <coughs> because what the machine bought was the depth search and the human brought something else, the creativity, the generalism. So I was like, okay, how do we do this? Because I write cyberpunk. This is very cyberpunk. So how do I actually use this in my writing? So it started out as me building an Instagram book with GPT-2. Stuck out on Instagram because I don't like Instagram poets. Uh, it said, ha, right, let it run. So it would, it would basically follow people and like, if they didn't follow back in three days, it would unfollow them. Leave, leave, leave comments like little hearts and so on in people's posts. It built up a little following and people are messaging and saying, well, this is amazing, like, your poetry really touches me. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> this, is, this is a giant Turing test. So then I started, I took that and I started really thinking about how this, how, like, what, what kind of story, what's interesting here and because language fundamentally involves, you know, a lot of thinking about Bertrand Russell, thinking around Wittgenstein, like, okay, how do I make a space opera slash um, colony simulator story? Because a lot of these strands of thought have also come from procedural generation in video games from colony simulators like Dwarf Fortress or RimWorld. And I was looking, I was reading the arguments, I was looking at what these create, what these game developers are doing and going, right, so there is significant history of tooling like these being used to build up stuff. So I ended up writing a galaxy generator that basically generates stars and and planets and attaches them to one another in a galaxy map, I wrote a plant generator, wrote stuff to tell me what weather was like and what, what characters could be generated. I was like, okay, how do you put these things together? So it, just, it, it started out as a tech demo, really. That is, so the the programs that you're writing are actually doing some of the world building for you in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. And, um, do you just take the output? Do you, do you take it and, and fudge it as you're going through or do you just work with what the program gives you? So I work with it. It's, it's kind of like going into an art gallery and seeing a bunch of paintings and being inspired to write something based on that. Except in this, the paintings are constantly changing and they're telling you what this planet is like or what the weather is like on each chapter. Or that, for example, one painting, I had a weather, weather system going that would say, okay, right, we had snow, we had rain, now we're heading into, uh, we're heading into hail and ice and the deeper snows. Another one popped up basically saying, oh, there's a character with an invisibility cloak and it's hunting these people. And I'm thinking, okay, right, that character in the snow, it's going to be bloody terrifying. Let's take that combination, let's work with it. So it's essentially like a lot of different things shouting at you saying, hey, use this, use this, use this. And you can sort of cherry pick and go, right, I'll take that, 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 and go with it. So it's almost like co-authoring. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. So this Has was a tech. Have you ever done that before? Has anybody ever? I know that they like people have programmed AIs and had them writ, uh, um, had them written books based mm. off of all the information that they've inputted. 
Like they'll, mm. they input, uh, I don't know. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was like, they input all of the Harry Potter into this AI. And then it develops a story based on all that and writes mm. a completely new story. Yeah. But has anybody ever actually uh, co-write if co-write with an AI where the AI is doing a lot of the generation and world building? I don't know that. Well, I've ever to the heard best of my knowledge, there were a few scattered experiments that didn't get far. And so in 2016, there was a Japanese literary prize that had a co-authored um, novel. And it was it was one of the finalists in that particular literary prize. And, and of course, this being Japan, this is, you know, instead of people clutching their pearls and going, oh my God, yeah, he's taking over. People are going, wow, this is interesting. This is very meta. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first published sort of commercial work of fiction. Um, but then there's this precedent for this kind of stuff, right? Uh, the, Classical computer science approach, which you mentioned, is where people take large amounts of text and feed it into a, a neural network, um, usually a transform architecture, and you have something coming out. The problem is, it's like kind of like showing Harry Potter to a baby and then saying, make me more of this, right? So your kid is not going to produce Harry Potter. <laughs> that's why, that's right. why a lot of these things produce nonsense. Yeah, because I, so I was I was like thinking about this, and this to me was as an author was fairly intuitive. Like we think of world building, we think of characters, we think of these different layers separately, and then we put them together in, in what we what we create the final product. So I was like, okay, these things can be taken care of. Well, like Diablo did procedural match generation. Elite has been you know, generating galaxies since for since the eighties, uh, and writing a galaxy generator is really not that hard. Uh, you just need to go, hey, yellow, you know, main sequence, yellow sun here, we'll give it nine planets, so we'll generate a couple of civilization artifacts around it. It's the RNG, the whole thing is RNG, right? The whole, yeah, the whole thing is pseudo-RNG, because there are ways of making it flow from one to the other. So that's where the stuff like Markov chains come in, where it will restrict certain states that it can go to based on what states it already occupied. So right. it's not going to go from, rate, so if it's weather, it's not going to go from rain to sun to tornado to sun to rain it's going to go from rain to let's have a bit of a monsoon situation light rain again and now we're drying out and now we have sunlight um i just um the wait we got a question in the chat as I'm losing my mind, ask you to, if he keeps recycling the output each time, like drawing a card and being like, no, I don't like, uh, I think I'll write on that. Oh yeah. 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 Um, except the thing is I don't have to recycle output. It's not like I don't have to shuffle the card back in because I can just have it generate like 400 cards and I can look at the full spread and go, right. I can like these things. Um, so absolutely. Because sometimes you get crap and there's an element, it's a, it's the human curation, I think, that makes Savage Group work as a story. Because if I let all of these things jam and I simply transcribe them, it would be getting nonsense. Now, is that the only way you used the AI to write your book, to come up with ideas and to see all the planets and stuff? Or did you actually help it, did it help you to write the prose? So the poetry in there is entirely AI, is entirely AI generated, which is... Which is, which is meta because the book is about a fictional machine poet. It, it's, it's about this uh, thing that this former human, now AI, gets sent to this backwater planet. He's so bored out of its skull that it's writing poetry. That poetry is generated by OpenAI GPT-2, which I took and retrained on a selection of my favorite poems to Rumi, 5th century Tang Dynasty, Chinese, uh, po uh, Chinese poems, uh, authors like Li Bai and Du Fu who are particularly adept at this, this style of painting a picture with their words. There's very little causality in those poems, but it's like this perfect image of a very particular scene frozen in time. It's like a Polaroid made with words. It's a beautiful style. So I took that and essentially created a poet bot. Um, and that was what was running the Instagram account. That was what's been writing the poems here. So that's, that's AI. That's hilarious. And it's also interesting because your main character who is um, supposedly writing these poems or having the poems kind of hit him, uh, he's kind of AI, but he's also from, he's a person. 
He's an yeah. actual person who's been. Is that a spoiler? No, I don't. Oh. I don't think that's spoiler. We know that. We do spoilers yeah. after we do the spoiler. So it's kind of. It's kind of a mixture. Um, so that that was a, that was pretty interesting to me as a reader to hear that that's actually true. That your main character. Uh, is his words are coming from an AI generated? Yeah, but because I'm more interested in that hybrid to the human plus AI story than I am interested in either the human or the AI operating alone. So in this case, it's me plus a bunch of programs, and it made perfect sense to have a main character that was basically an ex-human now AI, and you know, is may have lost some of his humanity, may not have, and you only really see like you see glimpses of it coming out. And he also sounds a lot like Nathan Fillion. Um, <laughs> yes. Nathan Fillion, he's varying the whole book, but from the very start, I was like, this is such a Nathan Fillion book. If you're a Nathan Fillion fan, you get his character, you get his persona, he just pours it into your words. But I can't help thinking that like the words seem to be written for him. Were they? Or did you have another character in mind, another voice in mind when you were no, it, writing it, text? It, 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 it wasn't written for him. So the, the sequence that this book went through is I wrote this thing and you know, when I was writing it, like people are like, Oh no, it's not going to, it's going to be crap or you're nuts. Um, and I was like, look, just wait for the final product. And then I gave it to Rhett and that was my Turing test, right? If will it, will it pass, you know, Rhett and Steve reading it, is that my Turing test? They liked it. I'm like, huh? Okay. And Rhett's okay, actually, yeah, Rhett's his bar is super high. Pretty much. And I, you know, I met the guy. I, I have a fair sense of like the kind of stuff that he likes. I was like, right, let's see if it passes this bar. Let's see if they actually want to take the risk and publish it. Okay, pass the bar. And then, you know, a couple of months later, uh, right after we signed the contracts and stuff, Red messages me and goes, um, hey, so how well do you know American Hollywood celebrities? And I'm like, well, I know a few. But like, I don't make it a point to, you know, know what the Kardashians are up to on any given day or so. Right. And he was like, well, um, Captain Mel of the Firefly wants to narrate your book. He's seen it. He likes it. Oh, and we're like, so and I, I was like, so let me give me a moment to just Google all possible synonyms of yes. <laughs> <laughs> and just paste it in chat for you. Right. I yeah, so that was that was right. That was all right. I'll see. It's uh, it's so cool um, seeing kind of what can happen in the ind indie industry and in the kind of a, the small pub world now with with mm -hmm. everything that how indie is kind of exploding, but more so how a small company like Athon can do big things just through the connections that they're making over time and, and doing this stuff. It's just so cool to see like, you know, galaxy's edge had Stephen Lang, uh, read, uh, one of their, uh, spinoff series. Um, mm -hmm. and you're getting, well, you know, there's the, the COVID is kind of all but shut down the movie industry. So they're looking for different things to do. And it's cool to see Nathan Filion and, and Stephen Lang and Rosaria Dawson and all these people doing these reads of these books. Um, because I think in audio, uh, and there's a lot of people I, that, that are still like audibles, not the same as reading or whatever. Uh, but audio is really a completely different market than print. And Absolutely. the people that are all in on audio, they like their narrators. They appreciate good narration and not just reading the book, but, you know, doing different inflections in your voice for different characters. And there's some narrators out there that do a super good job. Like you, you lose the fact that it's just one person reading the book and their, their voices kind of uh, help give that audio experience a, um, a really cool sense of, um, uh, just being in the story itself. Um, and then uh, actors, you know, they act and, and I think that's so cool, um, on the audio side. Uh, I'm actually really excited to, to listen to it. It's on, like I said, it's on my next to listen to, um, because I, I, I like, I'm a huge Firefly fan. I, I love Firefly. I love the, the, the writing, but you know, Nathan's acting in that was just superb like severely underrate uh under uh, appreciated because it was really really good 
And he's also been in, um, he's been in a few Halo games. In fact, that's why I, I, mean, I, I know this voice. I know it from Halo because I got around to watching Firefly much, much later. It's like, I, I've heard this man before. So it fit. The words just fit. The voice, voice sample came along and it was like, you know, it was like being, uh, how, how do I put this? Um, Trent Reznor writing Hurt, right? Nine Inch Nails. And then Johnny Cash comes along and covers it. And Johnny Cash completely redefines the song, right? Resno is a, is a young man writing about suicide. He's looking forward to a life of emptiness and he's contemplating suicide. And Cash's cover is completely different. It's an old man who's lived a life full of regrets saying, that's enough. And, but it completely redefines the song for you. Like once you hear those two covers side by side, the Johnny Cash version is most of the time what sticks in people's heads. So it was like that listening to Philly and reading the inner monologue of O.C. I was like, damn, this guy just redefined my own character for me. Well it's, like, it's like the, um, uh, I can't remember his name. He's the singer for Disturbed. His uh, his cover on uh, The Sound Dramian. of Silence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. David Dramian doing this, uh, The Sound of Silence. I mean, there's a complete redefinition of, of the original. Yeah. And it's richer yeah. for it. It's It's better. Oh, yeah, I, I could listen to that version all day long. Uh, we got another question in the live chat, but I want to do the, um, the where, uh, of course, I closed it. I wanted to do the sponsor. Oh, there it is. So the sponsor for today's episode is none other than Scott Moon's 13 Mercs, uh, just released on Amazon through Athon Books that we were just talking about. And... Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can nail his description. Let's see if I, I... I've not practiced. I know that's odd. 13 Mercs, a military sci-fi epic. Brother is it in arms book two by Scott Moon. The war isn't over. One victory can't remove the warlike alien armadas from the galaxy or vindicate the powerful elite and their mercenaries wounded separated from his squad michael priam must make an unholy alliance to keep the enemy from wiping the united galactic government from the star map when michael finds himself prisoner on an outlaw alien ship he is faced with recovering from wounds that should have killed him in time to fight a new menace facing the home system his friends will see his actions as betrayal but he must choose honor over happiness when he is cast onto an ice moon by a treacherous new ally he will fight a skull outcast to survive but also rely on him to escape in time to save people who won't thank him for it continue the fight that started on the slog grab the second installment of the brothers in arms of doom by scott moon pick it up yeah, man i nailed that pat myself on the back one's in the chat if you think that i nailed it uh go pick it up right now uh put the link in the uh chat there and uh give scott moon a little boost a little boost oh and review it review it give it a five-star review that's an order Nailed it with Valor. <laughs> Nailed it with Valor. That's right. Uh, okay, let's see. The live question that I found. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, John Evans got it. One. There we go. Uh, let's see. There was actually two from Silent Wolf. There we go. Uh, what made you to decide to build a simulator when he already ha uh, had made good stories normally? Well, okay. Thank you for the compliment. Um, Eagle. Ego. Really, just it. Ego. I wanted to just see to if I, you could do like, it. Yeah, like a like a large part of how I work is like even even my research, right? So I essentially like now now running two teams of researchers. Um, I was basically like, uh, you know, let's do this because we can. There's a there's a certain element of because we must, but mostly I'm just curious about stuff. And in this case, I wanted to see if I could use these different things to help me core, right, and whether it would make an impact. So I normally take a while to write a book, right? Because I'm writing one day a week. Um, that's when pretty much all my thought and writing on that happens. So I generally take like, in some cases, like a year up to a year and a half because I dwell build in detail and then I write fairly slowly. This, this was written in three months. Wow. 
this was me having fun all the way through. There was not a single, like, you know, that 60% mark where you're like, oh God, like, I don't know if this story is shit or not. I don't know if it's going to end. Like, how do I get over this? this Control that 50%? A delete. <laughs> yeah, I never had that with this. Every time I came to some sort of stumbling blocks, there's something splashing there going, hey, why do we have this happen? Why do we have this happen? Um, what if we had this? So I had, I knew the beginning, I knew the end, I knew where I want to take the story, and the middle was just being built for me. It was just fantastic. Um, this was me having an insane amount of fun after. Okay, so a little bit of backstory. I've been writing the sequel to a book I wrote for Harper Collins. It's called The Inhuman Race. It's only available in the Indian subcontinent. The sequel to that is called The Inhuman Peace, and that damn book has given me so much trouble. <laughs> I've rewritten that book like four times now. And there was a time when I actually hated that book. There was a time when I was like, I don't want to finish this. Uh, for some reason, it just, just did not come together properly. After, and I so if I said, okay, we're going to sit down. We're going to be professional about this. We're going to finish this book. And I'm going to do it to the best of my ability to the point where the editor goes, right, this is good. Did that. And after that, this was just such a walk in the park. This was just all out. Um, someone described it as Peter Watts meets Arthur C. Clarke. You know, like, like Audible reviews are going crazy on this. They, they like it. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, this is just me having fun. This is legitimately just me having fun. Uh, this is basically like the, the theory of intelligence at the end of it. I'm not going to spoil it, but this is basically what you'd get if you gave me like um, half a bottle of... Um, Dave Chesson does this thing where he occasionally drops by with half a bottle of really good um, bourbon. Give me some bourbon, a pack of cigarettes, and this is this is the output. <laughs> this is me in my happy zone. Oh man, that would be amazing. I I, I had a thought as you were talking about the the sixty percent mark and kind of putting that together with the the co-authoring AI. Um, and I know when I get to that point of the book i'm kind of frustrated at, at maybe how i'm stuck trying to get to where i want to be um and keeping the scenes active instead of just having that middle point slog where nothing is really happening yeah, yeah. um so this is actually a two-part question um one uh did the ai have an easy time coming up with ways to fill that slog with material that was interesting and also um when you wrote the scenes i mean obviously you're getting some in uh, the world building and all that stuff through the ai process but then are, i'm guessing that you're taking time to create the feeling of the scene out of your, your own imagination like you know oh, where yeah. is it and, and what what is the setting and the feel of all that so how did that combination go when you're writing that stuff sure um firstly yeah i think it's so it's less of a single ai and, and more collection of programs interacting with each other right you right think microservices one will kickstart something that the other will take and in the chaos something interesting is born um, so yeah, I mean, they absolutely, I think the programs um, had a fairly easy time. Like these things are tiny. A lot of the world building, for example, I put up the first version of the galaxy generator, but it's, it's crude. It's written in a language called R, but it's like a few kilobytes. It like, this stuff is not that hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so I, in terms of the, 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 the programs have an easy time. Yeah. Um, the poetry took a little bit more compute. It took a little, took a little bit more training because there you really have to have uh, training. A deep learning model requires a huge amount of compute. It requires lots of RAM. Like my gaming uh, machine is a fairly decent six cores, twelve threads. On something like this, it'll generally take about two to three days to train something like that. <laughs> yeah, so you start training. You basically use you don't use your machine for three days, and it just runs. Um, all in all, there was there were not that. I mean, it wasn't really a lot of stuttering or anything. Once I got the project rolling, um, with regards to how sort of imagination plays into it, yeah. So what I get was basically tiny descriptors. Um, if it's if it's weather, you know what the clouds look like, what the light is like, 
uh, I don't get like a full page of a massive page of text saying, and dawn rose, I mean, sun rose, and dawn spread its rosy fingers over the horizon. It's right. sun rose, right. and here's sort of the ambient temperature, and here's zero cumulus clouds. So I go, okay, right, let's turn that into, let's describe that. So it's sort of like someone showing you, uh, just showing you like a series of cards with the uh, data printed on it. And you're going, right, I can imagine that. That's super cool. I mean, that, so it's interesting because I kind of do that uh, with Google, right? Right. Like if I'm setting a scene, um, for instance, I had a, a a scene where it was it was dawn, and um, so I Googled dawn and just looked at a whole bunch of pictures that was a, a dawn from multiple places around the world, and then picking one to describe. So that's kind of cool that like your AI does that automatically, basically, where it gives you, you know, one, two, and three, and then you put the equation together and put it on the page. That's that's awesome, I think. It, and it, it, that's the thing. It, it's not as working with working with these things. It's not as alien as it sounds. Right. It it's just feels a different very, way of doing it. Yeah, it, but a large part of it feels very natural because we always do this. We look at reference art. We go, we Google search for little etymologies on certain words. We look at, you know, maps of cities and things to see where our, how our city should be designed. So this, a lot of it just feels very natural. It's just something gently just sitting there going, hey, I have an idea. Now, is this one of the things that helps you to work one day a week and still make that five to 7,000 word goal? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I mean, Contrary to popular belief, I am not not like I'm mostly human. Uh, Mostly, uh, says. Yeah, um, a lot of my fiction is written the old-fashioned way. This was just one particular experiment um, because I wanted to see if we could do this, if this is viable. It wasn't just so much hot gas. Now, the second and the third books will be written the same way. The seven thousand words, the five to seven thousand words a day thing is just me sitting down. I wake up, have my first cup of coffee and my cigarette. I have a thermos flask of coffee and I sit down with that thing. And basically it, it's just a lot of unhealthy habits that <laughs> lead to better word counts. That's right. There, there's, no, there's no secret sauce there. A lot of the folks in our audience are, you know, they've got lives outside of writing for most of the week and they only have one day of a week, but it's hard to get back into that creative mind space, mindset. Um, how do you do that? Um, I don't have a choice because, like, I so I essentially, like, I'm a data scientist. I have my research. I have my teams. I have stuff to do. Uh, I co-founded and run a startup called Watchdog. It's a fact checker. We now have about 150,000 users. So there's a certain level of management. There's a certain level of time that I have to sink into that. Um, on that one Saturday, all I try to do is, no, actually, no, I don't even get sleep sometimes. Um, I just try to just have no distractions going on whatsoever. I'll basically box myself in, turn off my phone. I don't go on 9gag, I don't go on Facebook, I don't go on Twitter. I have extensions that block pretty much everything. And I set my monitor to black and white mode. Oh, interesting. Um, Why do you do that? Because notifications, color psychology, notifications are designed to ping at you in bright red. Right? So we're drawn, we are drawn to that because red is not a color that commonly occurs in nature. Our brains are 10,000 year old design. This is optimized to go red, danger, look at it, look at it, look at it. And that's really the design of a lot of websites. Turn that to black and white and you find your Facebook usage just drops dramatically because all those color cues are not there anymore. Like every single, and every single, um, well, every single one of these colors is beta tested at scale on millions of people to see which one gives you slightly better optimization, right? So you turn that off, you're effectively turning off part of the machine that's designed to keep you on your feed, hooked in, just scrolling up and down. Wow. Um, so that's what they are. basically just set everything to black and white and I write, I'm still not the fastest writer, I'm nowhere near as productive as a lot of people I know. I'm faster than a few people, I'm slower than a lot of people and it's at like a, it's a comfortable level level to be at. I can imagine that um, so I'm, I'm a pretty fast typer, but my speed at writing 
is like I'll I can think of a, a sentence or or a paragraph and type that out in you know whatever a couple seconds or you know whatever but then I have to stop and go okay now where am I right what I'm happens right? next right yeah yeah um and that the what happens next part like sometimes I'll get to a a, a paragraph and I know what I want to say in the paragraph and I get halfway through and I'm like I don't know if that's the right way to say it and then I go back and I'm like oh, I don't know um so it's I typically don't have a a problem with the actual typing. My thing comes with I, I'm a kind of a perfectionist when it comes to writing, and so I sit there mm. and I just I'm like, how do I write that? Um, I would love to get five to seven thousand words a day. And uh, I, when I when I first went full time, I was getting that pretty. I was getting yeah around six thousand. Uh, mm. I didn't have any other distractions. I could just sit in my office and do it. And all the kids were everybody was out of the house, and now I've got to pick kids up and blah blah blah. Uh, but anyway, Scott McGlasson compared you to Hemingway, by the way. Uh, yeah. Him Thank you. Built a career. Yeah, built a career. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so he, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm look. I'm, I'm up to like a pack of cigs a day, um, and possibly about two to three bottles of Arak a week. Um, I'm here for a here for a good good time, not for a long time. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I love bourbon. Uh, I that uh, if I could uh, if I could start my day. So, this sounds worse than it is. If I could start my day riding with a bottle of bourbon, I would. But I like the coffee too. So, <laughs> uh, but you mentioned you're you're using the AI process for this story, but that's not how you do all of your work. So, one of my other questions was: uh, Are you working on the sequel now to the Salvage Crew? Or are you doing something? You mentioned that fantasy. Um, so, how's the writing process different between? I mean. Uh, technically it's kind of the same, but when you're talking about just like working on that fantasy project, what's your process like when you're doing that? Are you going through and uh, pantsing it all the way through? Or are you writing uh, in-depth notes as you go and, and uh, sit down to write? Do you have a list of this is what I need to get done today? How, how's that? How does that work for you? So how I usually write is like I, I'll wake up and I spent about an hour, an hour to half just thinking about what's going to happen. Mm. Like those five to seven thousand words that I have, right? I need to know what happens. I'm not gonna make. Um, I'm not gonna take extensive notes. I'm not gonna make a to-do list. But I think of if we think of the function of language, and that's that's language is a way of denoting concepts and the relationships between them. That's that's a Bertrand Russell axiom and axiom, and it's pretty hard to break. So I need to have. I find that I need to have the concepts of what I'm going to deliver in my head. And I, I spent like a good hour and a half just thinking purely about that and nothing else, like nothing, literally nothing else. Um, then I sit down and start writing, and then I find that everything else happens. You know what? You know where you're going. Um, you craft kicks in at a certain level, keeps the sentences flowing, keeps the structures there. Every so often, you write something that you go, okay, right, I can tune that, I can make that better. This needs to, you know, let's apply Chekhov's gun a little bit. Let's foreshadow this, but the rest of it flows. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing how other people do their daily writing because, like for me, I have a, I, I'm a pretty extensive plotter, and so when I sit down, I, I, I know functionally what I'm going to write. It's just like I said, how I'm going to uh, present the information. Um, like right now, I'm just doing a whole bunch of editing on the on the Tranquility book, but I'm also doing some developmental work for uh, a secret project that I'm working on, and it's always it's always more enjoyable for me to sit down and plan than actually do the writing. <laughs> so, like, I wish I could do the reverse of what you. I wish I could have an AI yeah. that would write the book after I plan it. Like and so, so interestingly, there was there's a book by a guy called Cal Newport. Um, it's called Deep Work. It's an absolutely fascinating look at some of the most productive people that you find. Deep and work, what it's called? Yeah, it, it's a brilliant book, and it, you absolutely have to read it. Uh, it goes into what enables people to do their best work fastest, and it looks at things like the cognitive load that context switching takes on us. Something as simple as all tabbing away or something as simple as, say, my cat demanding to be fed, the, the load of coming back to the context that we had in our minds before, that, that keeps getting progressively higher and higher throughout the day. 
And he looks at what people, what extremely productive people do to put this together. In my case, it's like I've tried different methods. I watch Brandon Sanderson's YouTube lectures, for example, and I've sort of not. got to. Pardon? Sorry. Sorry. We oh. have a game where every time somebody mentions Sanderson, we have to take a shot. Right. right. Oh. right. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've sort of got to a, a rhythm that works with my schedule. Like, if I was if I was writing full time, if I was writing seven days a week, I don't necessarily know that I might use this. It's just that this works, and it a lot of it comes down to just having that hour and a half very early. First thing I wake up of just being able to think about what I write, and the rest of it, the prose, all of that is automatic because I write the first chapter like before I plan anything. Um, I write the first chapter. And I try to get a feel for the texture and the voice of the writing. And then, and a lot of that is then intrinsic. That, that just becomes part of it. I don't have to think about it. I know what this story is going to feel like. I know if it, it's sort of playing out very visually in my head. I know what colors there are in the story. So once the first chapter is done, then I go back and spend, you know, usually months world building. Mm. And once I'm, once I'm very sure that the world is is rigorous enough to support like all sorts of different stories and all sorts of different characters and not just this one, then everything becomes so much easier. So uh, it's a bunch of hacks put together, right? I'm not sure whether this will be my one and only way of writing. I'm pretty sure this will mutate, but it works. Uh, well, it's always a process of iteration, right? Like this is how I, I world build and write this one. And then as I get, further along in my writing and understanding of how that works, you adjust things here and there. So I write way differently than when I started now. And I, yeah. I think if, if you stop iterating or, or learning different styles, then your writing is going to get stale or even worse can get, can, can become... yeah, absolutely. And you um, like, for example, now I'm writing a season of content. Um, which is meant for audio, meant direct for audio. And a season is, uh, an episode there is about five to 6,000 words. And a season is eight of these episodes. Um, and that's, that's the December project. And it's forcing me to think differently than I usually would when I, when I would write a novel. So mm. it's, it's fascinating. And hopefully, like, I think of this as tools in my toolbox. And just like a magpie, I keep bringing back more shiny stuff and adding it to this. And eventually, I'll have a pretty decent toolbox that I can, you know, approach situations with. It's really cool now, like, because uh, you mentioned the the six thousand words. So it's basically a short story. So it's a, it's a season of of episode short stories, right? Like, um, and it's Audible only. But it's interesting that Audible is looking for short stories for their plus and originals content. Like that is cool. Like just to have like um, the free, like uh, well, Stephen Rett's new book, the um, what's it called? Um, Steve Boyer. That's not spelled at all like it sounds. I'm just gonna do Rhett. How about that? <laughs> uh, Rhett. No, I, I have to say I appreciate uh, Steve. I think because of his last name has insanely high attention to detail. Um, this came in when we uh, when we saw Nathan Fillion's recording of this. We heard Nathan Fillion's recording of the Salvage Book, and Steve was like, "He mangled your name," and I'm like, "Okay, look, I, this is this is a fight that I have lost over many many, many years." I'm just right. like, so he is okay for for an anglophone, right? He's closer than many people will get to the left, and he's like, "Hmm, but he, he didn't get the th sound right." Now, this is interesting because a lot of people simply don't even register the Vijay Ratna. They, they don't register the TH sound at all. I was like, okay, how on earth did you manage to pick up on this? 
when most people that I know would not have. And it's a sensitivity around that name <laughs> that yeah. is spelling, I think, because yeah. he knows what it's like to be misspelled and mispronounced. Well, Steve actually sent me a message on Google or on Messenger asking me how to pronounce it, how I thought I pronounced it, because I did really well at it. Yeah. ish uh and so i yeah. sent him a sound file of me saying your name and he said he listened to it like five or six times so he could get he could get the uh the thing but so uh and this is slightly off topic but it's interesting to me um the pronunciation of different like for instance your name i didn't nail it i don't have it 100 percent because it's it's the name is native to your culture and language and i don't speak that culture and language so i don't look at the the letters and pronounce how they're set up for you um and it's interesting i don't know if you remember if you've heard of the uh, uh was it the hugos that george uh, martin hosted and it was all online and he mangled some of the names and there mm. was like a whole bunch of hate on twitter from all these people that were, and, and I know Twitter is accessible, but whatever, like they're like, of course, it's a white guy that's mangling all these. Uh, I don't know what culture they were from, but these names that he they were like, oh, he he even had the pronunciations or whatever. But even hearing the pronunciation, sometimes you're still going to get it wrong. And it's interesting that a lot of people get uh, uh, so many levels of butt hurt over the pronunciation. I'm, I, I'm sure well, I'm, I'm done on purpose. I'm sort of in, in two minds about this. Because on one level for my name, I, I've, I've spent years being misbalanced and I can go, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I, I, I don't objectively care about that anymore. Right. Um, however, there's an element of, for me, there's an element of professionalism about it. If you're hosting an international award ceremony uh, and you know this is going to be broadcast to the world, you're really you know, making claims saying you're representing the world of science fiction or fantasy. Um, and the pronunciations have been given. It's a matter of professionalism to get get those right. Yeah. Particularly when there's a team. Now, in this case, for example, it's just the three of us. We all friends. I can go. Yeah. Look, the, you know, my name. This is this is a thing. But if, for example, you were being paid by, hypothetically, Disney was funding this podcast. And right. Being mega bucks, and I go. Yeah. Get my name right. Which I'm not uh, opposed to. Which yes, get any my job, <laughs> get this funding job, <laughs> get with the program already. Yeah, but yeah. but yeah, there's 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 levels of differentiation beyond beyond where it goes from, you know, three people just casually figuring out how to get pronunciation together, and someone who should be should have been professional about it. Yeah, like, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, since we are so professional, can we practice your name? Okay. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. It's Yudanjaya Vijayvatn. Yudanjaya? Yudanjaya Vijayvatn. Well, can we, can we just do the first one? <laughs> first word, three syllables. It's uh, Yudanjaya. Yudanjaya. Yeah, say that a little faster. So it's like Yudanjaya. 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 Yeah. Dun yeah. Dun okay, and then you at home Let's try it, practice. try it, guys. You, too. you don't need to, trust me. And then <laughs> and the second one. Vijay Ratna. One more time. Vijay Ratna. You're you're quite Ratna. close. You're getting. Yeah. So one okay. oddity about Sri Lankan names is that like we write T N E, for example, because like my native alphabet has 60 characters. And it's a very phonetic, it's a one-to-one -one representation of, of exactly what you're pronouncing, right? There are different letters, for example, like L, there are two L's. There's an L that you can use with your tongue in one position, there's an L, an L that you get with the other. So this is denoted, but English doesn't have that degree of differentiation. In, in syllable delivery. So you often find people writing T N E when the actual pronunciation is something like T H N E and A at the same time. There's an E and A component and an R possibly. But it's not a it's not a it's a very soft R. It's an R that is clipped very sharply. So Yudanje Vijay Ratna is a no sound. 
It's like pterodactyl, and, and like, why would you write that with a P? Yeah, actually, actually English is, is a bloody stupid language if you really <laughs> think about it. Like, you have houses, but the plural of mouse is, is mice. Why? Right. Or like, like wound is also wound, and it's spelled it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. read and read. Yeah. And uh, English is, is basically, um, as all this um, comment really struck me as pretty damn linguistically accurate, right? Uh, English is the language that goes around in dark alleys mugging people and rifling through their pockets of spare grammar, right? Because you're talking about a West Germanic language, English, Dutch, Afrikaans, um, and German. There's other West Germanic languages. So you have a particular subject, object, verb order. You have a particular collection of tenses and the general structure of the languages are the same. And then English, for some reason, has it has Romance languages in it. That's the French coming in. It has some Celtic stuff in it. Uh, it. It has basically, like, there are words in there from Singular. There are words in there from every country that, that English has touched. And it's like this bastard love child that you look at and go, <laughs> you're ugly, but you can do things. <laughs> That's what English to me feels like. Like, occasionally I go, this language is ugly as hell, but it is incredibly efficient. Right. Because it's, you know, over generations, it's just that's what people have used it for, efficient communication. So it's like, hmm, okay, this is weird, but we'll go with it. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. We uh, are a little bit over, but that's okay. It's been a fun uh, conversation. I'm going to put the link to your book again in the chat. So if you're watching live, go and check. Oh, that's not the question. That's not the right button. If you're live in the chat, go and pick uh, the salvage crew up right now and give it a listen. Uh, the salvage crew. Give me money. Give you the money right now uh and uh thank you all for joining in the live chat uh it's been a fun conversation silent wolf thank you for uh coming and hanging out with us scott mcglass and john evans rick partlow uh, a whole bunch of people in the live chat today if you're listening on the audio stream and you're not listening live you need to come hang out with us uh tuesdays isn't normally our uh broadcast time mondays at 10 uh central is our normal broadcast time you could sub subscribe do it to our YouTube channel and you get little notifications. If you click that bell, Lauren and Kayleen do the writer's journey on Thursday nights. And you have, uh, the publisher of Daw coming on this Thursday. Yeah. President of Daw books. President. See one. I'm really interested for that. There is a thread in the Keystroke Medium Facebook group right now that Lauren started for questions. Uh, if you have a question that you would like asked during that episode, uh, go to it's a uh, it's facebook.com slash group slash keystroke medium or if you just search keystroke medium it's we're the only one out there uh, find the facebook group and then find lawrence post uh, and then put your question in there for the the doll uh, president um, we don't have anything scheduled for the rest of the year we we're, we're trying to work out a schedule for nick sansbury smith um, there's been a couple of, of dates that we uh, agreed on and then they didn't work out for whatever reason so we're gonna try to get him on by by the end of the year um but we're probably gonna take a couple weeks off uh, at the end of the year uh, i can't believe it's december already yeah doesn't it feel like you know a substantial just a chunk of months in the middle just vanished like we went from march to september and there was almost nothing in between yeah I think we're ready for 2020 to be over on a high note with Christmas and 2021 to be an awesome new year. I want someone to record the events of 2020 in painstaking detail and then just set fire to that horror document. <laughs> that's this year is. Have nice you guys thing. have you guys seen that? There's a couple videos that are going around there, like Vine videos, where um, the guy is is uh, God and an, like Gabriel and God is like, Hey, did you get done planning the uh, events for the 2020s and the angels? He's got this pad of paper and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it taken care of the 2020s. It's, like, yes. like plural. And God's like, yeah. And he's like, so the decade and God's like, yeah, he's like, mm, I messed up. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. and then, and then <laughs> God like walks off and he's like, Jesus, you're going early. <laughs> Some, it's hilarious. That's that's a weird thing, right? I keep thinking we have this joke that the 2020 writer's room is, is running at full tilt. Um, just when I thought that we would have no more surprising news for this year, someone sent me an article about dead rodents 
in Dutch cemeteries rising up literally out of the grave. Um, and it turns out they've just buried like hundreds of thousands of rodents. And the gases um, from decomposing are causing these things to literally appear like zombies just straight up out of the damn grave, right? I'm like, okay, guys, this is breaking reality. If I wrote this shit and I gave it to an editor at HarperCollins or whatever, they would laugh me out of the office I saying this. Believe it. Yeah, they'd say this, you know, we published fantasy, but not this kind. <laughs> this, this is not a realistic year at all. I'm hoping that 2021 doesn't come along and it's like, hold my beer, right? Like, like mm. let's just have a normal year next year. Uh, but anyway, starting in just a couple of months, I can't believe that. That's going to be super fun. Um, hopefully, uh, James S. Aaron is in the planning process for bringing a new show to KSM, uh, the KSM Network. And that'll be kind of fun. Uh, the artwork, his show's called That's Awesome or That Sounds Awesome. And the artwork is like a really 80s retro type vibe. So uh, I'm really excited for that show to hit the network. Um, let us know what you think. Leave a link, uh, like in the in the chat or on the video, comment, and let us know what you thought of this interview. Come over and hang out with us on Facebook. Uh, Yudha Hanjaya Vijay Ratna, thank you very much for coming back on the show. It was a great conversation. It was awesome. Thank you for having me uh well thanks guys for hanging out with us come back on monday don't know what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about something something about reading something about writing and of course you guys know it something in between thank you guys and you all have a great monday we'll talk to you later bye bye